Good afternoon. Welcome back to Metropolitan Community College's virtual Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month programming. People with ancestral roots in Asia and the islands of the Pacific have been and continue to be integral to the story of America. To celebrate their heritage and contributions, May was designated Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. The month of May was selected in recognition of the arrival of the first Japanese immigrants in the United States on May 7, 1843, and the significant contributions of Chinese laborers to the completion of North America's Transcontinental Railroad on May 10th, 1869. Your microphones are silenced. Please use the chat function to send your questions for our presenter to moderator Barbara Velasquez. Also watch the chat for a link to an online evaluation. How exciting it is today to have a former Metropolitan Community College employee present. His former colleague, Brian O'Malley, the college's Associate Dean of Culinary Hospitality and Horticulture is here today to lead this session. Please welcome Associate Dean, Brian O'Malley. Thank you, Barbara. Yes, yes thank you, Michael. The applause is uh, appreciated, if not deserved. Uh, I, I'm here uh, to introduce uh, Dr. Chang and talk to you all a little bit about some of his accomplishments. Uh, before we get into a, a presentation from him uh, about his story and his journey. So uh, Dr. Cheng is the Dean at the Chaplin School of Hospitality and Tourism Management at Florida International University. Uh, he's transforming hospitality, starting with the learner experience. He was previously a tenured associate professor and director of the food and beverage program there. Dr. Cheng does have subject matter expertise in competency-based learning, hospitality management, Culinology, which we'll talk more about, food product development, restaurant development, sensory analysis, and food and beverage management. Prior to joining Florida International, Dr. Chang served as the founding director and the department chair and the director of global studies and MBA programs and a professor of culinology at Southwest Minnesota State University. <clears throat> He's received both his BS and MS in restaurant food service management from University of Nebraska Lincoln here in Nebraska. But his PhD, he earned in hospitality management from Iowa State University. He has over 20 years of experience in teaching and learning in culinology and hospitality management and established the world's first and only academic discipline that blends culinary arts and food science, which is culinology. The Vilsack Foundation recognized his achievements by placing Dr. Chang as a finalist for the Vilsack Prize for Creative Promise in Culinary Arts in 2010. He's been honored three times by the Research Chefs Association, which we call the RCA, with the President's Award for his continued innovation, dedication, and leadership, and extraordinary contributions to the RCA community. Dr. Chang's been involved with established, establishing culinary programs, uh, culinology programs, excuse me, at University of Nebraska Lincoln, at Southwest Minnesota State, and Taylor's University in Malaysia. Dr. Chang has presented at various national and international conferences also been invited to judge several culinary competitions. He's now editor-in-chief of the Journal of Culinary Science and Technology, as well as a published author of several, several peer-reviewed articles on culinology. He's been awarded over a million dollars in public and private funded research. He serves as the board member at large for the RCA. Uh, he is a native of Malaysia. Please help me uh, welcome Dr. Chang for his presentation, From Malaysia to Florida, How I Went from Being an International Student to a dean at a public research university. Dr. Chang, welcome. Thank you, Brian. Absolutely. Uh, I want to I wanna go back to that life I had where it was a lot easier. <laughs> <laughs> this, this whole administrative thing with the dean thing, you know, is giving me a lot of white hairs. I don't know if you guys can see. Cynthia, I never used to have any white hair. It was like pure black kind of thing. Uh, I have enough for both of us right now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Fair enough. And I told my staff, I said, I'm just going to someday show up, you know, completely dyed black. And what would you guys do? They, they all threw their paper clips at me and <laughs> staplers at me. <laughs> so I'm not allowed to dye my hair, apparently, but um, I guess other people could. <clears throat> so anyway, thank you so much, Brian, for the introduction. Uh, I, do, I did prepare a short little presentation. Uh, let me see, share screen. I tried it earlier. I think it works. I'm going to try it again. 
Cool. Okay. So I'm just gonna run through. Stop me any at any time with any questions. Some of these pictures are a little corny, like for instance, this one. That's me and that's my dad. <laughs> Back in 1971. Uh, you know, I still have those cheeks. They never left. That's me and my brother. Uh, so my brother's a year older than me. He had bigger chicks than I, I, I do, did at that time. Now I have the big chicks. He slimmed down. I haven't. Apparently, I didn't lose. For me, I don't lose the baby fat, I guess. Uh, but that's me. I grew up in Malaysia. <clears throat> I didn't come here. Till I was an international student back in 1991. And actually, now I lived in the U.S. longer than I lived in Malaysia. It's crazy. So I grew up, you know, like all Asian families, expanded family. You got uh, aunts, uncles, cousins. Uh, did I have any nephews? No, no nephews and nieces at that time. So this is me. Wait, sorry, wrong side. This side. There. Up there. The one with the hair that's gotten a lot more shorter these days. Uh, and those two, actually, I'm going to move myself right in the middle. Those two are my sisters, my two younger sisters. And then my brother is the one all the way over there. <clears throat> and... Here's me in high school. So the last day of high school, I am right, sorry, right here. Oh, yeah. That's me. <laughs> kind of hard to miss that. So it was the all-boys school. And what did I learn last week? Anyway, you have an all-boys school, there's always an all-girls school, which is very true, too. It's typical. <laughs> and this is right before I left for the U.S., <clears throat> my brother and my, my father. Uh, so this, I think, this is 1991, no, sorry, 1990, because January 1991 is when I came here to study as an international student. And then I landed in Nebraska, you know, that back in the 80s. No, sorry. The hair. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> so don't forget the earrings. Have that too. <laughs> I still got the, the, the hole from it. Um, but I haven't tried to put anything in, not recently anyways. That was my best friend in, in high school who is now the CEO in Malaysia. Um, what is the name of the company? Kipple Pay. So it's an online payment platform, millionaire, you know? So obviously he figured it out. I'm still a uh, government servant, apparently. Still working at it. <clears throat> and then um, met my wife while I was in grad school. We got married in 1998 and we actually just celebrated our 24th anniversary on Monday. <clears throat> uh, we spent the week at Sandals Grenada. It was awesome. If anybody is looking for a little Caribbean island with, with really friendly people, has, have you guys, if you guys have gone to the Caribbean before, you know how some islands are a little pushy, like Jamaica, you know, they want to sell you everything under the sun and, and you got to like push them away. You go to Grenada, no one's trying to sell you anything. They're very polite. I 100% uh, recommend Grenada if anybody's looking for all inclusive vacation. Sandals. <clears throat> So the most important people in my life, my family, my wife, and my dad, uh, who is 78 this year, no, 79 this year. So he's uh, really a, a real father figure to me, honestly, and taught me a lot of my values and morals and what you should and should not do. Uh, even when I was in Minnesota, so I have, sometimes I was having issues with what to do next. I would just call him and he give me the best advice. So I haven't seen him a couple of years because of the pandemic, but um, totally looking forward to it. My two younger sisters are now both grown up, both living in Australia. One's an artist. So um, Jackie is the one in the middle. Sorry, this side. That's Jackie. <clears throat> and then the other one's Kathy, who's a registered nurse now. She was a tax accountant. And she decided that tax accounting is just not something that excites a lot of people. <laughs> So she was able to put away a lot of money and change careers and become a, re become a registered nurse. This is my path. <clears throat> you know, went, came to Nebraska, and I'll go through each one of these a little bit deeper too. Uh, went to school in Nebraska, got my bachelor's in restaurant management. And right when I was graduating, I, you know, what, one of my students here recently told me too that they just didn't feel like they were ready for the real world uh, and they were getting the bachelor's. So I wasn't the only one back in 1993 at that time. <clears throat> uh, I told my advisor at that point, Dr. Hamus, and she said, well, stick around and do a master's and we'll give you a graduate assistantship. So that's how I got my master's. And that's why I got my master's too, because she offered me a graduate assistantship. And then after Nebraska, <clears throat> I started working as a food service manager for uh, what is called Treat America Food Services today. But back then it was called the Swanson Food Company. And it was in BNI, Business and Industry, I ran 
food service accounts for corporations. Did that for three years and then ended up at Metropolitan Community College, which was a stroke of luck. Uh, I think what happened really was I got bored in my job and decided I was going to look around. And then there was this opening as a program coordinator at Metro in the culinary program. And I met the qualifications. And, and honestly, I think they hired me because I had a master's degree because they were going through accreditation. So it's like a requirement to put somebody with a master's degree on there. And that's how I got a job. And it was basically a kitchen manager's job. And I know how to manage kitchens. I was like, yeah, I can do this thing. So I got hired. It was, I was there for maybe two years before I started teaching. And teaching was like one of those things that I just accidentally fell into. It was never on my plan. <clears throat> you know, so working at Metro was really my first step into higher education. Uh, and Metro has been very, very good for me. And it has really uh, jump started my career in the in higher education, but not only that, but also in culinology with the Research Chefs Association. Uh, so how I got into teaching was there was one semester that they somebody backed out and it was an intro to hospitality class. No, I think intro to culinary arts class. And I said, you know, sure, I've never taught before, but I'd be happy to try it. And I was actually late to class, my own class on the first day, <laughs> sitting in the office. I was like killing time, waiting for class to begin. And I get a call from student services asking me where I am. I'm like, I'm just sitting in the office waiting. So your class started 30 minutes ago. I was like, oh shit. <laughs> I ran in there. All nine students were still waiting. Thank God. <laughs> so somehow I was able to save myself out of that one. Um, my time in Metro then, <clears throat> it was in that role for five years. And just, it just allowed me to really explore myself and my skills and what I could do. Also allowed me to transition out of the role that I was in into a different, entirely something else, entirely different as the assistant dean for math, science, and health careers. And I think what got me into that was I was trying to see if I had transferable skills, you know, if, or am I always going to be working in the kitchen? <clears throat> so I tried that. I got to tell you, that was like probably not the best decision in my life, mostly because I love hospitality and food so much and I just missed it. <laughs> so when Southwest called, Southwest Minnesota called and they were looking for somebody to start up the culinology program and asked me if I knew anybody, I was like, yeah, me, I know me. <laughs> so that was a stroke of luck. Ended up at Southwest Minnesota State and I got that was another one of those things where um, being in the right place at the right time happened for me. So. They, they, were, they brought me in as the uh, founding director for this culinary program to create it. And then when I met with the president and, and he learned that I had a degree in hospitality, I said, well, you should start up the hospitality program too, because we shut our down like three years ago. I was like, okay. So then right off the bat, I was starting up two programs. Uh, they also appointed me at the associate professor instead of the assistant professor level, which at that point, at that time in life, I had no idea what that really meant. So other than there was assistant professor, there's associate professor, and there's full professor. But what it allowed me to do was skip a step in the promotion process, which was like, um, you know, I should really thank Southwest Minnesota State for giving me that opportunity. And then I uh, ended up getting early tenure at Southwest, uh, but they told me I couldn't be promoted unless I got a PhD. So I said, okay, fine. I wasn't planning on it, but since they told me I needed it, so I went and wrote it. At, started off at St. Cloud State University, and I was probably, I probably made that decision because it was free, just paid for by the state university system. But then after my advisor tried to change my research topic, I said bye-bye, and I just went over to Iowa State instead, transferred everything and all the credits that I had taken, and was able to finish at Iowa State University. And that's how I ended up with my um, uh, PhD in hospitality there. And then how I ended up at FIU was also another different story. So at Southwest, I figured out, and uh, I, I was very fortunate that, you know, there's this weird hybrid role between a faculty and an administrator. So you're not a full administrator, you're not a full faculty either, but your whole faculty rank. And when you're in between like that, you have administrative responsibilities and autonomy and the protection of the faculty. And that's like the sweet spot. I'm like, cool, <laughs> I like that. So I wasn't gonna go anywhere after I finished my PhD, but I stumbled onto FIU, which at that point uh, in 2014 as the conference, I had no idea what FIU is, where they are and what they do, I never heard of a school, but they were looking for somebody to do a food science program. And that's how I ended up at FIU. <clears throat> and uh, that same year too, before I went to the conference, my wife and I spent I think three days in Miami on spring break on vacation. And we just said jokingly to ourselves, 
this looks like a nice city. You know, we could probably, we like the food here, we like the people, it's a vacation destination. Maybe someday we'll move down here kind of thing. Literally December, 2014, I packed up everything. We had sold a house in October and then started work in, at FIU in January, 2015. <clears throat> so it's very strange. Stroke of luck. So back to Metro. <clears throat> Metro is where I started the culinology program. Uh, hired as a program coordinator, became the assistant dean. Uh, Brian, you remember Jim Tribune? A little bit, yeah. <laughs> Wait, this way. Yeah. <laughs> and that's me in, I think this is 2001. No, <clears throat> Do I still look the same. You look better now, man. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> so that's where, so honestly, this whole culinology thing was because Jim Traven gave me the opportunity. He came to me with this piece of paper that called, and he called it the research chef uh, concentration. And he said, go to this conference, the Research Chefs Association, Association Conference, and see if they would let us teach this research chef concentration. I said, okay. Uh, you know, I had zero culinary background. I knew how to run a kitchen, but my, I'm definitely not a culinarian. And I went to the conference. I spoke to the president. He goes, yeah, I know we like the idea, but we really want a bachelor's degree. I said, well, Metro doesn't offer bachelor's degree. <clears throat> we still don't, right? Or do we not? No, sir. So I went to the next best thing, which is I call up my advisor at Nebraska and I say, I, we can offer the culinary. Can you guys offer the food science? He goes, well, I mean, nutritional science and dietetics. We don't really do food science, but we have food science department. We can make it work. And that's how we got the program together. You know, so the first curriculum for culinology was like, we decided this set of classes look good. This set of classes in Nebraska look good. Let's put them together, run it by the RCA, see what they think. They made a few revisions and that's how we launched it. You know, it's just all input from people from the industry. Um, not so much anybody else, but a couple of faculty members. <laughs> and we actually got that approved. You know, the, the nice thing about this is it was unique that nobody understood what it was, so they weren't going to challenge it. Uh, today, try doing that in, in the faculty senate. Everybody has an opinion. Right? And everybody wants statistics, wants you to do a feasibility study and all this other stuff. Yeah, that would not fly today. So <clears throat> we did that. Uh, Nebraska still has it, but it has, has since then moved over to uh, Department of Food Science. <clears throat> so it's no longer within the Department of Hospitality, Restaurant, and Events Management, I think, which is where I graduated from. So what is culinology? <clears throat> it is li literally what I said, combination of culinary arts and food science with food technology. Culinology itself is a made up word, registered trademark by the RCA. I don't own it. The Research Chefs Association own it. Um, not that they're actively policing it, you know, so if anybody wants to call it, use it, they, not that I'm telling you guys to use it, but you can <laughs> freely. <laughs> so RCA owns it. Uh, and <clears throat> what is the RCA? <clears throat> so RCA founded in 1995, and the way it started was a bunch of classically trained chefs got together at an ACF, American Culinary Federation Conference, and decided that, hey, we're a subset of the Food industry. We're not food scientists. We are classically trained chefs, and we can. We should form our own own group because we're developing food products in commercial food co uh, corporations. <clears throat> so that's how they founded the RCA. Uh, initially, it was all chefs, and then they decided after that to expand it to include educators, food scientists, nutritionists, technologists, and so on. Now we always get this question like, what is the difference between that and molecular gastronomy? <clears throat> so molecular gastronomy really focuses more on the art, whereas culinology is a little more not a little more, it's a lot more practical. You know, and you can see here the definitions between the two. Molecular, molecular gastronomy is art for the sake of art, I guess. <clears throat> and, and it's all about the experience, you know, how it's finely, high, finely tuned, it looks beautiful. It's just, you know, in, in one word, not scalable, okay? Whereas colonology is scalable. The whole intention is let's bring better tasting food to the masses, okay? Let's not continue serving lousy food. So that's the big difference between the two. Why is it important? <clears throat> it ensures culinary authenticity. So you, you want food to taste like food, not food that has been butchered and mixed with a whole bunch of preservatives. So it looks beautiful or not looks beautiful. It lasts longer, but it doesn't necessarily taste as good. <clears throat> uh, it's time and labor saving because they do, we, we do do real feasibility studies in there. 
you know, you, you understand what parameters you have to work within in the food industry and you develop your products with those parameters in mind. So you're not going to create something that's not commercial, commercializable or not scalable. Uh, you can create new novel and trendy, you can develop new novel and trendy new products uh, and enhance the quality of old products, but maintaining the commercial viability of it using science and technology here. Let me move myself out of the way. And then shelf life, <clears throat> you know, so maintaining the color, not only the culinary authenticity, but also not sacrificing the sensory attributes. So we've always said food scientists, food technologists, uh, food technicians don't really understand food the way culinarians do. And which is why some foods taste the way they are. Because you, when you're putting in through a bunch of processes, all different preservatives, you tend to lose the real authenticity of the food, right? But now we're seeing actually more food scientists and tech, food technologists who understand what food is supposed to be like. So I think it's matured quite a way now, uh, even without calling it culinology. You know? So where I ended up, when I ended up in Southwest, I launched the program there. At that time, it became the largest program in the United States. Um, sad to say today, it's no longer the largest program in the United States, but I did leave behind a beautiful kitchen. So that was the article of um, when we did a $1 million renovation. It was gorgeous, state of the art. <clears throat> And my time at, at Southwest was very interesting. Like I said, I was there for nine years. Southwest really did give me a, a, a jump start <clears throat> in my career. And I thought I was just going to stay there forever because it was a nice little town. It was safe, it was secure. People, people like me. I like people. <laughs> and I probably would stay there if I didn't just happen to fall into FIU. <clears throat> and then I finished my, oh, by the way, remember I was saying, how I wrote the curriculum. We just got together a couple of faculty, threw it back against the RCA, asked for feedback, and here you go, here's the curriculum. So what we didn't do is validate it. <clears throat> so of course today you got to do feasibility studies. Right around 2009, 2010, when, uh, when I was told that I needed to get a PhD to be promoted to full professor, I decided, well, I know one topic, culinology, and I know we didn't validate it, so that's my research topic. It's a passion. I want to go back and validate what I wrote. <clears throat> so thankfully, the results show that the curriculum is solid. Whew. <laughs> Try explaining that to <laughs> the thousand plus students who have since graduated. Hey, I'm sorry, we're going to make some changes to your curriculum. You know? <laughs> so we did survey all the graduates that came out uh, since the program's inception for my, for my dissertation. <clears throat> And then I ended up at Southwest Minnesota State University. Um, this was an article that came out from RC, uh, the Culinology Magazine, <clears throat> right after I got there. And what I've done then at Southwest Minnesota, uh, sorry, at FIU, did I say Southwest? No, FIU, <clears throat> is that I was hired in to start a food science program. Didn't realize that the, my predecessor, the previous dean, didn't really have enough support to launch a new degree program, especially food science. So I got here, I was all excited about it. And then after, I don't know, like a year into it, <clears throat> they say, no, we're, we're killing it. I was like, well, I guess I'll just hang out here and be associate professor and director of food and beverage program. And literally six months after that is when I get a call from the provost uh, for a meeting. I was like, okay. <clears throat> so I went over there and they said, we want you to step up and become the interim dean. I was like, what? <laughs> I've only been here for two years. What do you mean you want me to become the interim dean? I barely know how to run a school. The biggest school I've ever ran was all of 120 students. And we have 1,800 students here with an international campus. So, well, it's interim. It's not like you're going to be doing this for life. So, okay, let me think about it. So I went back, talked to my wife. And actually what changed my mind was when I asked the provost, um, he said, his, his question to me was like, if you didn't do it and we hired somebody else to do it and you didn't like the person, what would you do? So, you know, that's a really good point, right? So if I can control my own future, why not control my own future? So I took a chance, <clears throat> uh, jumped right into it and did the interim dean ship for a little over two years. It's probably the longest interim dean ever on the planet. And then had to go to a national search uh, and became the dean permanently in February, 2020. And then the pandemic started in March. And I was like, here, you guys want a job? You can take it back. <laughs> of course, they weren't going to let me off the hook that easily. So we were able to get to a pandemic, thank God. Uh, but this role has really allowed me and opened my eyes and my, I guess, my experience to do, try a whole bunch of crazy stuff. <clears throat> now, it was also during the interim deanship thing that we landed the biggest gift from Bacardi, $5 million. 
uh, and this was when I when I was an interim dean. I later on when I asked the folks from Bacardi, I said, "You guys knew I was interim dean. Like, it's like, why would you invest five million dollars into an interim dean and his or her vision?" And I said, "Well, we are insight sources." It's like, oh, <laughs> so you knew before I knew what the administrators were gonna do. <laughs> but uh, FIU is awesome. You know, it's major metropolitan city. The university itself is fourth largest in the country. Our school, we graduate the most. Uh, degrees in hospitality management, but our demographic is really amazing. <clears throat> I got 70% of female population, but the diversity knocks the not socks off. 38% uh, are international, another 39% Hispanic, 12% Blacks, and literally, uh, I think 10 or 11% Whites, and maybe 4% Asians. That's it. And we, we are so diverse. You know, it, it's like everywhere you go, and there's a bunch of names I can't pronounce. I still can't pronounce them because of our diversity. <laughs> but I remember remember having these graduate roundtables that we would do, uh, not roundtables, mixers. <clears throat> so we have a huge online population as well. About 30% of students are online. And I would sit down at a table. We, we would invite them to come in, free food, sometimes free booze, but don't tell anybody because we have the partnership with Bacardi. And I would sit down at a table. It would be like five graduate students and all five from a different country. It, it's just like, wow, where are you from again? <laughs> Why are you here in Miami? It's just it's incredible the diversity that we have here. And then we have a campus in China. We're the only ones in there. And this is our 18 year. So, you know, uh, US uh, operating in a communist country. So the China US relationship is not that hard today. But the partner that we have in China is super, super good. We're very pleased with them. Uh, we try to keep politics out of the way, which for the most part, it does work, you know, but it does prevent me from being able to share openly or broadcast and promote that we have a, a campus in China. <clears throat> and then of course the South Beach Wine Food Festival. So FIU, the nice thing about FIU, even though we're the fourth largest, right? <clears throat> it has really grown in size probably in the last 10 to 15 years. Uh, so if you imagine when you are in a small college in a big city, you can pretty much do anything. Like nobody's gonna stop you. <clears throat> and that was the mentality all these years. You know, that's how we got the South Beach Wine Food Festival. Uh, that's how we got a campus in China because we're like, yeah, let's just try it. What we can, what's the worst thing that can happen? If it fails, it fails. We learn something. But that's how we got a South Beach Wine Food Festival, which today has raised uh, in excess of $34 million since 2002. It's the best, single best hands-on experiential uh, experience for our students. Our students are doing everything from logistics, culinary prep, marketing, uh, transporting, dealing with talent, customer service, welcoming guests, everything from, from A to Z. <clears throat> um, what else do we have? Oh, and then, of course, like I said earlier, we're, we're just sometimes crazy and we don't sit around for, for long. We discovered that we have an alum uh, that graduated from FIU in 2003, who is the son of the founder of uh, Sandals Resorts International. <clears throat> and when we discovered that, we were like, hey, we should talk to this guy. So we found him during the pandemic. Somehow he agreed to do a Zoom session for us. And then the relationship grew. And now we're in partnership with them to develop a school down in the Caribbean, which is the Gordon Bush Stewart uh, International School of Hospitality and Tourism. So, oh, I forgot. Food incubator. <clears throat> so that's one of the things where, I, where, where you have too much time in your hands and trying to figure out what to do with your life kind of thing. This was right after they told me I couldn't do a food science program. So I was like, okay, well, I got culinology. I know I don't have a culinology, culinology program here at FIU. I couldn't start one e either because my po student population here is different and the food manufacturing industry doesn't exist in South Florida. It's all in the Midwest. So I was like, well, I guess I'll just sit around and be a hospitality management professor. And I was like, I got all this kitchen space. You know, they're like half utilized. Why don't we turn in a food incubator and help the community? So we actually got a half million dollar grant from City Foundation and we started promoting this and we got I'll first go around 12 low, um, uh, not low, uh, yeah, low to medium income minority entrepreneurs to come in and set up shop in our kitchens. Basically, we say, here's the space, we help you with expertise. So we, we gave them workshops on financing, marketing, branding, and they all come with passion. They don't necessarily know how to scale up the business. And that was our intention to help them scale up the businesses. <clears throat> um, what else do we do? Oh, and, then, and then the industry relief fund too. So the South Beach Wine Food Festival raises approximately 1.5 to 1.8 million dollars for us every year, which is like, it's, it's literally cash for us. We use most of it on scholarship. 
during the pandemic, when it first started, we saw how hospitality was affected and we decided we need to do something back for the industry that has been very helpful to us. And said, let's put in a million dollars. <throat> so we just took, from, instead of giving the students, we could, thankfully we had some extra money. <laughs> we said, let's start it up. And all we did was just created a, a simple application form and we dispersed $1.6 million to independently owned operators and bar owners <clears throat> in South Florida. And then David Grumman is another thing that we did. So I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with him, but he's he's an entrepreneur down here. He very strong social media presence, seems to know all the celebrities. The nice thing about Miami is like a lot of celebrity celebrities seems to want to come down here. And for some reason, you know, he owns the two nightclubs, Live and Story, has a few restaurants. He's, so he's very successful. But his aspiration was to teach, not full time, but he just wanted to exert his influence with students. So I got into this meeting where I met the guy and within five minutes of sitting down, he told me he wants to teach him and I was totally not prepared for it. And I, so, so I said, yes, sure, why not? <laughs> so that's how we got him to teach. And that was the best decision I ever did. <clears throat> because his first class, he brings in DJ Khaled, right? And we were all like, what just happened? <laughs> DJ Khaled walked in the class at FIU. <laughs> Nobody could have pulled that off. You know, it's crazy. Uh, the second time we taught, he brings in David Beckham. And so, so there's no way you can get in front of David Beckham unless you're paying a lot of money, right? And here's David Beckham going around doing selfies with everybody in the class, all 200 students. It was just incredible. His, his reach is amazing. So that's what I've been doing here at FIU. It's been a great ride, honestly, uh, but I'm not done yet. <clears throat> We've got plenty, plenty more to do. Uh, like, like collaboration is one thing that I'm really focusing on today. And because I... I I know where our lane is, you know, we're strong in hospitality. We're totally not going to like try to ex be experts in other discipline. And I think collaborating with other people who have the expertise is where we need to be going. Uh, so I'm always happy to, you know, any opportunities we can work with you, Brian, on bringing a student here to FIU for the Selfish Wine for Festival, we're happy to do it. Uh, that's uh, incredible. I'm that's I'm an coming. incredible invitation. Yeah, Cynthia, I'm, you coming, I'm, get, coming, uh, I'm coming with you. Michael, <laughs> Michael, you know how we do. Yep. Yes, we do. Yep. You should come. <laughs> well, we'll we'll probably drive though, Dr. Gooch Grayson. So you're gonna have to road trip with us, but that's, that's all right. Fine. That's, that's fine. That's fine. You no, know, we have uh, direct flights from Omaha to Miami. I know, but we like driving. That way you can stop for peaches on the way, man. You know that. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Cheng. This that was an, an incredible journey through uh your path and uh, for us to see all of that was was really in both enlightening and inspiring uh, we've had some questions come up from folks as you've been talking uh, and I'd love to share a few of them uh, with you let you address some things uh, the first one I think was sparked by the uh, ridiculously awesome picture you had of your dad uh, that uh, was really cool and it's it's great to see that you still have a good uh, connection with him um, it, it sounds like the advice that you've given him has always helped you uh, guide your path. Has that uh, mentorship given you similar strengths in working with your students? I mean, do you feel like you're kind of channeling your dad uh, as you work with students in some of those situations? And maybe, you know, parlay that into how you would recommend or what recommend, recommendations you make for students uh, as, as they're looking into this as a career field, right? Hospitality, culinology, <clears throat> culinary. Uh, what advice would your dad give through you in that regard? It, it, for me, I think it's um, integrity, you know, it, it's, and his work ethic is really what got to me. Um, I, I still work, it, it, I wouldn't call it seven days a week, but it's almost seven days a week. And that's what he did. You know, he was always dedicated, committed to his work, uh, and he always did things. He never half asked anything. He, he put his soul and passion into whatever he was, and he always looked at it from all angles. And I learned that from him as well as from my previous supervisors at the University of Nebraska Lincoln, where you know it's, there's always more to more behind the story, like more than one side to the story. <clears throat> if that's the right phrase. Yeah. <laughs> so you just need to not have rash judgments, <clears throat> uh, not react, you know, and just think about it. Sometimes sleep on it always helps. But doing the right thing is is what I learned from him best. Uh, similarly to the first president that hired me at Southwest Minnesota State, you know, he had told me to at one point, he's like, you know, if you don't want to, if you don't want to end up on the front page of any newspaper, then don't do it. And I was like, okay, good. I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> so that's, that's what's guided me, I guess. Those are, those are two great pieces of advice. Uh, 
that, that's a, a great one. Somebody in the audience was asking about uh, documentaries, things like What the Health, uh, other documentaries like that. I mean, as a you know trained food service professional and a, uh, somebody with a master's in nutrition, uh, what do you think of documentaries like that? Documentaries like that, that track what you do, like reality? Well, uh, so What the Health as a documentary is something that is uh, talks about food's impact on kind of the obesity crisis in the United mm. States. Uh, you know, it's along the same lines of documentaries like uh, Wasted or Fast Food Nation, things like that. So how do you see them playing out in the kind of academic world? How do you see them playing out in the uh, food service world? I think, um, so here's something you should know. <laughs> I don't really watch a whole lot of TV, <laughs> uh, much less read books. Uh, since I finished my doctorate, I probably haven't picked up a book. That was like 10 years ago. <laughs> it's Fair enough. shameful. So, uh, but when it comes to those kind of mainstream events, I get most of my news on my little phone. It's like in the New York Times sends a little synopsis every morning. That's where I get my mainstream news from. And then if I find something interesting, I click on the link and I read the article. And that's about the extent of my reading that happens on the day. Because I, mean, I do so much other reading at work, you know, for papers, for emails, which is just like, some days you feel like you're in email jail. All you're doing is just replying to emails. Uh, so back to your question, <clears throat> you know, those documentaries, I wish I had time to actually sit down and watch them. I probably would have an opinion, but I just don't have, I don't make time, I guess. And they're not yeah, fair high enough. priority for me. <laughs> But well, I, makes will, me, I will make makes time me think to too. Wars. Yeah, time for Star Wars. That's fair. Uh, it makes me think too. You know, I certainly see keeping up with the news and current events through uh, the streams you're talking about. But do you think the professional organizations and commitments that way are enough to keep you up to speed professionally? Um, yes and no. So going to conferences does help because <clears throat> you you do interact with a bunch of other professionals and you get their their points of view and you learn what's current so i think those are very helpful for professional development um if you're going to a consumer conference uh, that helps too because then you're seeing what's trending and you can bring those back to you uh, i i think a lot of what we see on mainstream media tv and social media a lot of that really is yeah, sensationalized you know, news especially but sometimes you see those news and you're seeing the same pictures over and over again same short video clip over and over again it's like okay maybe that happened for a split second but really it's not like that 99 percent of the time but people seem to believe that that split second that it happened so uh there, there's a part that captures your attention and imagination but you should really stop and think about what's the rest of the story behind it you've articulated very well the way i try to tell people about the difference in culinary television and the reality of the culinary industry, right? That mm -hmm. so many people fall in love with thinking that uh, I want to go to culinary school because I see this happen on television and it sounds, you know, it looks cool and exciting. And you're right. Uh, the, those 30 minutes called out of eight hours of filming do look pretty exciting, but the rest of it's still peeling potatoes and mopping and, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. arguing with the guy about uh, deliveries. Like, yeah. Uh, it's it's mostly work and a little bit exciting. So yeah. all, those, uh, well articulated. All, those, all those culinary competitions that you see on TV and all the excitement, you know, stuff catching on fire. You know, you might have caught on fire for two seconds. Okay? Right. The rest of the time, everything is fine. But it was the two seconds that the camera focused on that made it look exciting. It's like, yeah. That's why I wish every time they filmed a commercial, they didn't make us light something on fire. I'm like, that's <laughs> not what happens over here 99% of the time. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the diversity in your program. I mean, uh, the numbers are mind blowing. I mean, I, I don't know if I've heard of an institution that has uh, the kind of diversity that you're talking about. Tell me how that happens. Like, are you guys marketing like crazy to diverse populations? Do you think just the culture of the school itself is kind of feeding its own uh, recruitment? I mean, what's generating that uh, diversity? It's our geographic location, honestly. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I don't think, I think if you picked up FIU or even a Chaplain School of Hospitality and you move it to someplace else, it would fit in with the location that is, it's in. So right up north to me is not far away, three hours, maybe less than three hours, it's uh, UCF, University of Central Florida. Sure. And they have 64% white students. Yep. And it's only three, less than three hours away from us. And I have 12%, right? 
So you got to wonder, well, same state, you know, they're a little bit bigger in size and, and Roman size, <clears throat> but they graduate less than we do, which I can't figure out why other than they're not, put, they're keeping them longer. You know, everybody's concerned about metrics and graduation and retention metrics today. So I don't know why they're graduating them, graduating less degree standards, <clears throat> according to the iPads data. But I think a lot has to do with the location, the your geographical location. So when I look at um, Cal Poly Pomona, for instance, in California, huge percentage of Asians. Uh, I think it's almost 35%, if I'm not mistaken. And that's, you know, it fits the nature of it. And then I look at UNLV and their hospitality college over there. And they have a pretty e equivalent sized uh, Hispanic population as we do, about in the high 30%. And their Blacks are not as, as many as we do. Uh, I wish our number was more actually, <clears throat> but it's not. And so I'm not sure where it would be. But interestingly, too, when I started looking at Blacks and African-American students and the enrollment, we actually enroll more and graduate more than the largest HBCU hospitality program, which is it blows my mind, too. You know, and because when I look at we have 170 Blacks and African-American students and the largest HBCU program, I think, has less than that, which are like, hmm, that's weird. So it really goes so back if to you graphic. could, do you think that the uh, rate of diversity, even if it's only happening because it's reflecting uh, your region, do you think that diversity is positively impacting the quality of the program and positively impacting graduation rate? I don't, we work hard at our graduation rate. Last year, we approached 80% for your graduation rate. This year, it's going to be about 74%. Um, but we really do work hard at maintaining that high level. And we do a bunch of different things through having a flexible curriculum and really working with students. We find a lot of students' biggest challenge is financial aid. So I'm very thankful that I have access to the South Beach Wine Food Festival Fund because that money comes across as unrestricted. And in many times, I'd say a lot of times, when a student tells us or tells an advisor, you know, I have $1,500 that I can't pay in my tuition or my housing bill, we're like, no problem. And within the 24 hours, they'll get the money deposited into the account. There's no application, no nothing. We just give it to them. Now, that's what we use the fund, that fund for specifically, is to remove those barriers. We have a very healthy endowment here that generates about $600,000 a year. And then together with the South Beach money, uh, I'm able to award almost $1.5 million in scholarship. And this is just hospitality. Now, if I took awesome. all the hospitality students, it's about $5 million together with the financial aid and everything else and all the other scholarships that's given. When it comes to quality, <clears throat> I think what we are seeing is our Hispanic students have, you know, it's almost like our students in, in Metro, <clears throat> in the Midwest, maybe not necessarily Metro, but in Midwest, where they don't want to like leave, uh, go, venture too far from home. So I'm seeing a lot of that here in South Florida too, where I say, hey, hospitality, great big wall, job opportunity here, internship opportunity on the West Coast. No, I'm good. You know, and it, I can't really fault them because tourism is such a big driver down here in South Florida. So it's hard to say, I'm sorry, you, you can't get a job here. You got to go <laughs> when they can't get a job here. Now you're, uh, what you're talking about right now aligns with a question that came from one of the audience members about, uh, you know, in Nebraska, we think of Florida, Miami specifically as this kind of exotic locale that's very far away. Um, like if an FIU student was going to try to get to the Midwest, what, what do they want to see in order to be attractive to them to, you know, come out this direction? I mean, you've certainly already talked about the anchor of home being real, but, you know, what are those things you think that get people away when they do move away? I think, you know, this is where representation matters, you know, and we're very aware of that. Uh, you know, I talk about diversity in our student demographic a lot. And unfortunately, my faculty diversity does not match my student diversity. Oh. So I work really hard trying to make sure that the students see who they, they resemble, right? And we do the same thing too with the guest speakers. We're very aware and cognizant of that. There was a period of time where we, we have this lecture series. And it's like three times in a row, it's a, uh, three white, old white men. I'm like, guys, hold on a second. If you keep doing that, what's going to happen is that, okay, so the only way I can ever be a CEO or owner of the company is to be an old white man. That's not what you want to convey. So you have to really start being intentional and being purposeful in who we bring in so you can inspire hope to our students. <clears throat> you know, it's the same reason, too, that we uh, intentionally created a position and endowed professor in diversity, equity, and inclusion, 
we modified our curriculum and made the B and I a required core class in a hospitality program uh, starting from last fall. So we're the only ones to do that because we really truly believe in in the diversity aspect and especially inclusion, really. <clears throat> so back to representation. Right? Here's another funny story. Uh, I'm very competitive with only one school, and that's UCF because they're just so close to me. But yet people are growing that way. And I keep asking why, and they keep telling me like when people leave home and they only go north. Go no, I don't buy the theory. You know, I said if people from Orange County where uh, UCF is, why don't we just go in the back and recruit from them? They'll come south to us, right? And then they tell me, well. You know what we we've heard too that uh, your school our school is too diverse. I was like, what do you mean too diverse? It's like, well, if you look at their student population, the sixty four percent white, they don't want to come here. <laughs> We're never uh -huh. why. <laughs> I was like, oh well, that's never crossed my mind before. <laughs> well, I think you've got an opportunity to to lay on that as the strength that they should seek to be a part of, right? That yeah. an opportunity to study right in an environment that's that diverse mm -hmm. opens doors uh, to people from all backgrounds, but certainly to the 64% white kids. Like they're going to learn a whole new universe uh, by taking the chance of coming down to Florida International compared to going to UCF. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I, try. I, I guess we're recording this. I shouldn't bag on UCF. They're wonderful people. I've They're wonderful many people. Of them. I've met many of them. I'm just competitive uh, with them. <laughs> well, it's good to be. I mean, I think it's that uh, competition is important, no matter what, to have somebody that you're benchmarking against and, and pushing back and forth against. So yeah. uh, having that's a, a great one. Um, do you see students coming into your program that have been coming out of community college environments ever? Do you do two plus two agreements with folks? We do. We do. Okay. Our largest student population is actually transfer students. And we have a very strong relationship with Broward College uh, in Broward County, as well as Miami-Dade College in Dade County. Sure. So those two colleges brings in almost 70% of our student population, our transfer students. Is that across the FIU or that's just in just Chaplin? Just, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and it, I think a lot of it is because we created our curriculum to be that flexible. Uh, you know, we want to maximize and we understand the strain it puts. You know, a lot of students are really working class family students. Yeah? They're not rich, they're not privileged. Uh, we're still, our institution rate is only $7,000 for the entire year. So, and Florida has this, um, uh, what's it called again? Where the parents can invest into their student tuition fund. Yeah, yeah, 529 plan. Yes, but it's a specific name for it. <clears throat> so they, they're coming here like literally with very zero, zero expense, with very little expenses. <clears throat> but then we are international students. You know, there's another population that, because I am a former international student, so I know what it's like when you come here and you got all these challenges. And Miami is not cheap to live in. <laughs> rental for a lousy one bedroom apartment is like $2,500. It's like, geez, you just want to die. <laughs> so you just imagine, you know, if you can offer money and help them out, let's do it, you know. <clears throat> uh, but definitely we do work a lot with um, uh, Brow and Miami Dade. We, we have been getting some students from Kirkwood Community College in Iowa. Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah. But not that many. We have gotten, I think, a half dozen uh, per year, roughly. <clears throat> uh, oh, I, I did forget to mention, our campus in China which is a full four-year program. The first two years are taught by the, the school in China. The second two years are fully taught by us. So the second two years is 100% in English. First two, first two years is in Chinese. Uh, but they get an FIU degree and they get a TUC, which is the name of the school degree. <clears throat> so that program there and some weird law in Florida allows any student in state or out of state or international students to study abroad at the in-state price. So we, we actually get about 40 pre-pandemic, 40 to 50 students going to China every year for that reason. They're saving money. You, China's cost of living is a lot cheaper. Uh, there's dormitories on campus that we provide. And it's just, it's a grand old time, you know, and then- so They're in China, in China. playing in-state Florida rate. Yep. Even if they moved to China from somewhere else. Which we do have several who did that. That's amazing. <laughs> there's a kid who was there for three semesters. I kept going, I said, why are you still here? Like, man, I'm saving so much money. <laughs> I have to say that the uh, transfer rate into the program and seeing how many people you're picking up from uh, community colleges and elsewhere is also very, very impressive. And I think that uh, uh, is a model that four-year institutions could absolutely take a look at. Are you doing anything uh, to share that across the uh, spectrum, whether with other hospitality programs or uh, you know, just with institutions writ large. I mean, there's so much opportunity to take on people 
uh, that have accumulated credits, yeah. perhaps piecemeal, maybe purposefully, uh, but to take them in as third year students, so to speak, uh, and then flex your program in order to help them get to the finish line seems like a great strategy. Are there, were you sharing that out somehow? We're not snooty. You know? <laughs> we're, sure. uh, you know, we're still a state public university, guys. You know, we might be R1, but we're still a state public university. We're still a hospitality school. Uh, doesn't matter what your background is. It's the same industry that we're all going into for hospitality. So and we, we don't see ourselves. Oh, by the way, we don't have a PhD program. So we're not high on research, but we understand uh, and we've actually been focusing on it. For us to move up in ranking and reputation, we have to have a stronger research component. So, and I understand there's differences in faculty too. So you got faculty who are strong researchers, faculty who are strong teachers. So split them up. Let those who do well in the initial do what they do really well. So I've tasked the researchers, which is only a handful, like eight of them, to I have 40 full-time faculty. So only eight or 40 are strong. I say, do your research component, the rest focus on teaching. What we've delivered really well here is what we call, I don't think it's a real word, wraparound service. <clears throat> so whatever your problem is, whoever you first talk to, we're gonna help you find a solution. We're not gonna just pass up the next person. Uh, we go to bat for our students a lot. So we follow a lot of exam, uh, exam waivers because uh, I, I don't believe every rule in the university is a set rule. Like these deadlines, I think they're all arbitrary. You know? There was a rule that say you had to be registered for at least one credit in the semester you're graduating. So if you think about it, international student misses the graduation the last semester, and then so they have to stick around for commencement next year and they have to be registered for one class. Well, they already have living expenses. Now you're making them pay another thousand dollars to register for one credit just so they can graduate that they do not need. That's ridiculous. So we filed for waivers. <clears throat> Uh, we actually get comments from <laughs> the provost office. I say, you guys follow a lot of waivers. I go, yeah, because we're going to bed for our students. Yo, so some of these rules are like arbitrary. Who made them up? I, I will say if somebody asked me the lesson that I learned from the short time I spent with you, that's it. And uh, it aligns actually with a lot of lessons I learned from my own dad. But um, that your uh, advice to me around here was there's always a way to get that done for a student. And yeah. I think that's the truth of how we approach everything, that uh, we don't ever let it be that, uh, I mean, the last data dropped just past two days ago, and I bet we've dropped three more students since then, because that date's also made up. Like, exactly. uh, I get it that they are made up for a good reason, and to follow it most of the time is a great idea, but mm -hmm. uh, to do it in spite of what a student needs to be successful seems like uh, uh, anti-mission. Uh, in a way that that doesn't make sense to me, and uh, certainly that sentiment has uh, continued to exist in our department here. And I don't know if you instilled it here, and I inherited it, or if Jim uh, fed that fuel, or uh, maybe our dads had coffee one time and both gave it to both of us. But uh, I certainly I certainly buy into that as well. So uh, thanks for keeping it, thanks for starting that around here too. It's a hospitality spirit, you know. So four times a year, uh, the university administration gathers all the deans and it's almost like an inquisition. Every college goes up one at a time with our, with our executive team and we get inquired on everything, your metrics and everything else. So we did it a few times and then finally one of them finally says, you know, you guys do really well with the student experience piece. Can you just like codify it? Just write up what it is that you do. I'm sitting there like, I don't know what we do differently from all of you guys. You know, and then it occurred to me a few months after that, that the reason why I don't know is because I haven't seen the other way. <clears throat> I don't know what they do. So I can really write up something that I think is normal that they're not doing. You guys want answers, just come to us and ask us. We're happy to share. But for me to sit down and write what we do differently, I, I can't tell you what's different. I, I thought it's our way, you know, it's customary. I think maybe sending them all a copy of Danny Myers uh, setting the table might be a good start because uh, yeah. I see that as uh, part of the game. So anybody on the uh, conference that hasn't uh, seen that book. It's an awesome book about the power of hospitality and business. Uh, I'm sure it's, it's it somewhere inside your program. Somebody's probably teaching it. So it, it's a required reading for the restaurant management class. <clears throat> uh, and and when I taught it last in the fall semester last year, so it's required reading and I'm so lazy. I can't read the book. I just got it on tape uh, on uh, <laughs> audio. <laughs> Well, you still like ride your bike and stuff a lot, don't you? That's probably a good time to I listen do. to a book. But the instructor, it? the instructor's yelling at me all the time. You know, I can't listen to anything else. But oh, fair enough. <laughs> I imagine you rode your bike outside in the wilderness. You're riding a Peloton or something like that. It is a Peloton. Fair enough. 
Uh, we don't have a ton of time left, but uh, a great question that came up that's uh, just a super interview question anyway, we ask it on every internship site visit we do is, if you would change something about how you started in your career to help you where you're at now, right? If you could go back to the uh, 1998, when did you start in Lincoln? Somewhere around there, 1991? 91. Right, and give that Michael Chang some advice about, hey, do this differently and you'll be happy that you changed this habit. Uh, by the time you're 2022, Michael Chang, any thoughts on what you'd uh, wish that 18-year-old guy would have known? I, I probably would have studied abroad while I was an undergraduate. Awesome. Uh, I just, I just it, it was such a missed opportunity. I, I don't know if it wasn't presented to me or not, but we see that happen here too, where, so 1,800 students, and we do a semester at C, study abroad option, and we get 80 students. Uh, you think like 1800 of them want to go on a semester at sea it, it's for two weeks and it's only 1800 dollars. so it's dirt cheap you know uh -huh. so we don't know why they're not more students doing it <clears throat> uh, and we literally have scholarship money that we throw at them just like go study abroad i think that experience is incredible uh, it's like when i got into this interim dean role and i learned oh hey we got a campus in china i've never been to, to china it was not on my bucket list of places to go and the first time I got there in Beijing, I'm looking at us with my mouth wide open. I was like, why, why did I wait so long to come to China? This is amazing. <laughs> uh, so. that's, that, that's fantastic. And I, I, I don't know how to answer the question of why more students don't go. I think we all knock our heads uh, against it a little bit there. Um, mm -hmm. But I, being a good example for them, I would imagine helps a little bit. And 80 is a great number. Uh, I don't think you should be ashamed of 80. That sounds uh, like a fantastic uh, success there. Uh, one of the things that I really want to do next time I get the chance to be in Miami is come to one of your dumplings with the Dean session. Is that what you call these? Yeah. Tell me about this. Sessions. So it, it really started as a way to engage students, not so much for them to engage with me, but really to pull the students together. <clears throat> and for us, it's, we've always have a strong engagement and in initiative. You know, people are so busy in their lives, they're going to classes and then they zip out of classes, but why don't we give an opportunity to hang out? So uh, I think the dumplings part came because of the D with the Dean. So we're like, let's find something that matches. And I was like, let's do dumplings with the Dean. And in, the first time we did it, <clears throat> we we bought frozen dumplings and we cooked it up and it was great sit around, chit chat kind of thing. Then we went to China to replicate it. They said, no, 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 we're just going to make the dumpling. It's like, wait, what? <laughs> so here I am with a bunch of Chinese students <laughs> making dumplings. After I did that, I was like, dang it, we should do that in Miami. <laughs> so the next time I came back and did it here, I was like, we're going to make dumplings. We're not going to buy frozen dumplings to cook. And we did. It was such a blast. Uh, but it's really camara camaraderie building, you know, yep. build relationships, great conversations. People just have a great time. <clears throat> uh, now the relationship we have with Bacardi, so we have access to free liquor, and that could get dangerous, but that's also a fun time. <laughs> that's spectacular. Well, uh, Michael, I know we're pushing up uh, on the end of time here. Uh, I want to certainly say thank you uh, for being so open and sharing and being willing to tell us a little bit about your story. Uh, you, you've had an incredible success, and we're glad that uh, MCC got to be a small part of it. But we're also glad that you shared today and uh, gave us something that we can share back with students uh, and folks in our own program. I was uh, overwhelmed uh, by my own age when I went around being excited that I got asked to moderate this and only <laughs> Timmy and Linda knew who I was talking about. I was like, what's happening? Uh, and so that's uh, a heartbreak that I need to remedy around here and make sure that yes. uh, the story of you gets told a little bit better. Uh, it's, so, it's not much of a story. Don't worry. Uh, about it. <laughs> let's work on some collaborations uh, and find some ways where we can uh, be together. As time goes on, because that would be really, really spectacular. So, absolutely, uh, certainly you have my thanks uh, for being here. I know Barbara, uh, who puts a lot of work into making sure these things come together, uh, wants to share her thanks as well. Uh, and mostly, I'm trying to get her to unmute so she can cover me if I forgot to thank some people, because that's important too. Uh, so, Barbara, thanks very much. Thanks to both of you, um, Michael. It's really great to see you again. I see some people who knew you on the screen and thank you for letting us record so that um, we'll be able to put this out on our YouTube and those who missed you will get that opportunity. Um, I would like to thank Brian Connolly who's been our tech support today and Brian could you please put up the slide for the evaluation. Oh, awesome. um, you got that where uh, the web address in your chat so please give us some feedback.
check out mccneb.edu slash Asian for our final program, which will feature Um Marquardt, who is a native of Thailand, and she's going to talk about Thai culture through food. So we'll see you next Wednesday, May 18th. Oh, I'm so sorry, the time on that is wrong. She's gonna be on at 12.30. Apologies for the, the mistake on that. 12.30 is the time for that event. Okay, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Good, afternoon. Good to see you, Michael. Good to see you to your picture, Cynthia. Yes, <laughs> take care. Cheers, Bye. everyone. Bye.